morning scripture reading is Numbers 6, 22 to 27. The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, This is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. I was telling her, I tell her when Cameron walks out the door so she knows to follow. <laughs> she can't see him. <laughs> You'll bow your heads with me. We'll start in prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and adore you. We thank you that not only would you send your son to die on the cross, but we have the promise that he is going to prepare a place for us, that he is our advocate in heaven, that we are yours. If we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone, Lord, you, he, you will not only sanctify us, but change us through and through to be more like Christ in this world. You've given us a mission to be a light to this world, to be an ambassador to those that are lost. We thank you for this privilege, Lord. So today, equip us with your word. Fill us with your spirit, Lord, so that we may do the task that, that you have given us to do. That this world will grow strangely dim and we will live for the sun rather than living for the things under the sun. And we just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. And when I prayed that, you might have caught sun as in under the sun, because if you read Ecclesiastes, um, Solomon said everything under the sun, S-U-N, is meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. But if you live life under the sun, S-O-N, you will find the true meaning of your existence, the very reason you were created, the very reason that you were redeemed. So talking about that, I entitled this as Time in the Wilderness. Because we read Numbers also. You should have read all of Ecclesiastes, Numbers chapters 1 through 6, and Revelation chapter 10 through 16. So what do you think about when you hear the word, word wilderness? What does it make you think of? You think of things right off, of course. Do you think of um, loneliness? Do you think of death? Do you think of uh, no growth of things? Do you think of just looking out and it just being dry and barren and sand? What do you think of? Well, what do you think about when you talk about wilderness in the Bible? Hmm, maybe something totally different. Because many things happened in the wilderness to let God's people know that He was with them every step of the way, even in the wilderness. A time that you might meet God face to face, even though that there are temptations in everything. So that you know that without a shadow of a doubt that you are loved by God. That He will be with you every step of the way of this life. Number 6, 22 to 27. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, This is how you are to bless the Israelites. Bless them. Say to them, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause His face to shine upon you. And... Uh, and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance toward you and give you peace. So they shall put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. God's intent is to bless you. God's intent is for you to be His, to be in a relationship with Him, to know His love so that you can love Him and love others. But yet we go through this world and we think that God is far from us at so many times. Or He doesn't care or whatever it is that's going on in your life. But He's with you every step of the way and He even forgives your stiff neck rebellion against Him. All you've got to do is turn, repent and turn to God. And He will always be there for you to bless you, to love you, to, to lift up His countenance towards you and give you peace. Moses was a spokesperson for God and Aaron was the priest, but they sinned and they could not lead the Israelites into the promised land. We read Hebrews not long ago and first part of Hebrews, um, the author talks about how Jesus is so much greater than angels, so much greater than Moses. 
Moses brought on the law. Moses led the people and everything. But he could not do what Jesus Christ could do because he is a sinner. We are all sinners. So God sent his one and only son, a spotless lamb without blemish, to be sacrificed, to lay down, to pour, the, pour out his blood as a penalty for our sins, as atonement for our sins, so that we could be redeemed back to God. Revelation 16 verse 15 says, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who remains awake and clothed, so that he will not go naked and let his shame be exposed. Verse 16, And they assembled the kings in the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon, a place of struggle, a place in the wilderness, a place where death will pile up, but not if you choose life. See, those wilderness times, every time you're in the wilderness, all you have to do is choose to turn your eyes upon Jesus Christ and receive all the blessing, all the peace, all the joy that He has intended to give you, regardless of the situation that you're in in your life. Remember, death has no sting for you. What can man do to you? He can take my life from me? Okay, oh well, I will be in the presence of God. Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 to 14. When all has been heard, the conclusion of the matter is this. Fear God and keep His commandments, because this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, along with every hidden thing, whether good or evil. Now, if you didn't catch it, those verses were taken from the last chapters we read in each one of those uh, passages that we were supposed to read. We were supposed to read through number 6. And we read about the blessings that were there. We were supposed to read through Revelation 16. And Jesus warned us again and told us to look forward for the blessings to stand firm. And then Solomon says, The richest, wisest man that ever lived, when he chased after all these things in life, he said, When all has been heard, the conclusion of the matter is this, Fear God and keep His commandments. Let His blessings fall upon you. Spoiler alert. Today you're going to read Revelation 17. And you'll read this in verse 14. They will make war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will triumph over them, because He is Lord of Lord, King of Kings. And He will be accompanied by His called and chosen and faithful ones. Where are you going to be? You're either with Jesus or you're against Jesus. You're either gathering or you're scattering. You're either decreasing so He can increase. You're either hearing and obeying or you're being disobedient and in rebellion still. The choice is up to you whether you'll be there to accompany Him or not because Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords today. He has been ever since the beginning of time as we know it and He will be into infinity which we cannot even understand. Scripture says that everything has its purpose and meaning based on Jesus Christ. So are you living for Him? As you read through the Old Testament especially, you learn of kings and kingdoms. And you see the failures of the Israelites over and over and over again. And that's okay again if we turn to God. If we understand that when we fall down, we cannot get up on our own. But all we have to do is reach out to Jesus and He will lift us up. So do you realize that He is your King? Do you, do you profess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is your Savior, but also your Lord, your King, your Master, your Redeemer, your friend? Because they all go together. Look as you're reading Revelation, look at all the names of Jesus Christ. He is worthy, worthy, worthy. How many of the Israelites, when they left Egypt, do you think, thought to themselves... I won't be able to enter the promised land. You ever thought about that? Everyone that left Egypt saw the mighty finger of God over and over again, and then their enemy destroyed as they parted through on dry ground. They all thought that they would enter the promised land. But because they didn't firmly fix their faith, it led to other things like grumbling and complaining and idolatry and a longing to look back into the enslaved life that they were. Wow, when I think about that, I think, how in the world could they do such a thing? But when I look at my own life, I think of the things that entangle me, the sins that entangle me and snare me up and everything else, the things that I put my faith and trust in. 
I went back to see Phil this week because my hip was still out of joint. You know, I just thought I was getting older. <laughs> he worked on me week before last, I think I told you that. And then it got a little better, but it didn't get better because it popped back out of place again. And because the hip was popped out of place right here, it affected back here, it affected my ankles, it affected my knee, and my knee still has fluid built up on it where I move it about that far and it's just painful because that fluid is compressing. But I feel it easing. The things we take for granted each and every day that we have, we should live our life for Jesus Christ and for Him only because we don't know if we'll have tomorrow. And if we longingly look back, you got to ask yourself, will you even make it to that promised land? Because Jesus said that he would divide brother and sister, father and mother. They would be divided over their loyalty to him, their love for him. And he said, you'll be known by the way you love because you'll love him so much, you'll love God so much that love just flows out of you. You can't help it because you don't want anyone to die not knowing Jesus Christ. It permeates you and fills you to where you give Him thanks in any situation that you're in. And then when you get a little relief, you thank Him even more. And you say, okay, let me run this race even better now with more endurance so that I don't fail to, fit, to reach that finish line. God made a covenant with Israel. He called them out to be holy. He rescued them from the bondage of slavery so that they could go into the wilderness. And don't forget this. Moses told Pharaoh this time and time again. He said, so that my people may worship me. Which that word means that they will sacrifice to me. They will, they will thank me. All of the things that's, in, that's part of worship. And yet, how long did that worship last? And they even worshiped the idols that they worshipped back in Egypt, a calf just popped out. A golden calf. Really? But we longingly look back to the things that we thought before had meaning in our life. Money, security, health, as I just mentioned, when you don't know if your health is going to fail tomorrow or not, or totally be extinguished. But you rely on these things instead of, God, what is your purpose for me today? And how can I live my life for you? And who can I tell about Jesus Christ? By what I say and the things that I do. But only two of those who left Israel entered the promised land. Because they held firm to the faith. They wholeheartedly loved God. Wholeheartedly, not half-heartedly. Half-heartedly means that I am an adulterer, plain and simple when you look at it that way. If I told my wife again, I said, Oh, honey, I love you some of the time. You think she'd be happy with that? Or I said, Oh, I love you this much, but not that much. I'd do this for you, but not that for you. She'd say, um, You could have probably find a new wife before long, wouldn't she? Because she wants my wholehearted love and affection, and I committed that to her when I said I do. So why in the world would we want to be adulterous against God who created us and redeemed us by the precious blood of His Son? Hebrews 11.6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who approaches Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly, diligently seek Him continuously, passionately, Revelation 14, 2. Here is a call for the perseverance of the saints who keep the commands of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. By faith you're saved. By faith you'll make it through this journey. By faith you'll spend an eternity in heaven where every tear will be wiped away. There will be nothing more related to sin. All things will be made new. Are you keeping the faith of Jesus? What does that even mean? It means you fix your eyes on Jesus and the things that come up, you take to, to Him, you take to the cross, you take into prayer, and you say, not my will, but your will, Father. Your kingdom come, not my kingdom. Let me be a light to this world. Let me be the feet of Jesus Christ, the hands of Jesus Christ. Whatever it takes, I must deny myself first, then take up my cross, whatever that is, and follow after Jesus. Nothing should keep me from doing that. 
And I'll make it all the way to the promised land, won't I? If I wholeheartedly love and worship God. And Joshua and Caleb didn't even know the name Jesus, did they? Obviously, most of Israel did not keep the faith. They forgot. They didn't teach their children. They grumbled. They doubted. They complained. And then they longingly looked back. It's a step when you walk away. When you walk off that path, you get further and further unless you turn and come back. You get further away from the light into the darkness, and the light is supposed to extinguish the darkness, and the light will extinguish the darkness. Just turn on a light in a dark room. It travels so fast you can't see it, but it travels from the point that the light's turned on to wherever it, is it reaches, and it will extinguish the darkness. Jesus Christ has already done that. He said it is finished. There is no reason for any darkness in your life. There is no reason for any doubt, no reason for any fear. If you'll just trust the Lord, fix your eyes on Him, guaranteed without a doubt you will meet Him face to face and spend eternity with Him. Luke 9, 23 through 26, Jesus said to all of them, If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. I like the Luke version better. They just didn't have a banner of that. Because that word daily is in there. It's a daily that reminds me every single day I have to deny myself. Every single day I take up whatever cross that is to follow after Jesus. Every single day. The day that you stop, that'll be the day that Satan attacks you with that fear and that doubt because you haven't fixed your eyes on Jesus. You haven't read His Word. You haven't prayed. You haven't spent time listening to the Holy Spirit. And that's when He'll come in and attack you when you're weak in the wilderness, when you're hungry. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world, yet lose or forfeit his very self? If anyone is ashamed of me and of my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Later in that same chapter, verse 57, Jesus is walking along. And as they were walking along the road, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Verse 58, Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Then he said to another, another man, Follow me. The man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, Let the dead bury their own dead. You, who, however, go and proclaim the kingdom. Still another said, I, fall, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me bid farewell to my family. Then Jesus declared, No one who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And you can analyze that scripture all over and over and say, Well, the man's dead. Dad wasn't dead yet. He wanted to wait for... You know, but here's the thing. It's not about these other factors. It's about you, me. If Jesus calls you today to do this, what excuse are you going to have? Or are you going to say, here my Lord sent me? Because whatever excuse you have says that's bigger than what the Lord is calling you to do. And realize that Jesus didn't have a place to lay his head. That he didn't have family that he needed to worry about. He had a mission to do no matter what happened to his kin. He had a mission that God was sending him on to lay down his life for his sheep. And no greater love that a man have than to lay down their life for a friend. And you will be known by the way you love one another. You are called to follow Jesus. Yes, we still live in this world. Yes, we still have things in this world. But if you don't put your faith and trust in Him and put your faith and trust in God, these things will work out. Even when there's tragedy even when it seems like the wilderness is bare. God is big enough to handle it all. Give it to Him. Because no one who puts his hand to the plow and begins working is fit for the kingdom of God if he longingly looks back at what you had, what you thought was good, what you put your trust in, whatever it is. You fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith that you proclaim. And then these other things will work themselves out. Later in Luke, 
chapter 14, there were large crowds, verse 25, were now traveling with Jesus. And he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and his wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. I you will have no other gods before Jehovah God. No other loves. Because what he's done for you he has brought you from the gates of hell and given you eternal life at the cost of His Son. So you are to love Him with everything that you have so that love permeates out of you. You cannot be His disciple if you don't love. And whoever does not t carry His cross and follow Me cannot be My disciple. Which of you wishing to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost to see if he has the resources to complete it? Otherwise, if he lays the foundation and it is unable to finish the work, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, This man could not finish what he started to build. Or what king on his way to war with another king will not sit down and consider whether he can engage with 10,000 men, the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is unable, he will send a delegation while the other king is still far off to ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good. Changes the, the, what he's saying here and compares his disciples to salt. Seasoning, flavor, preservative in this world. And the only way that salt as a chemical compound can lose its saltiness is being by, being, by being diluted, by being watered down. Whatever it is that's making you long back to that world, whatever you're putting your trust in, whatever you're doubting God in, fix your eyes on Jesus. Don't worry about the giants in the land. Know that God has told you you can do it and get into the promised land. Salt is good, but if it loses its savor, with what will it be seasoned? It is fit neither for the soil nor the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears, let him hear. Doesn't that sound like what you read for the letters of the churches in Revelation? Where Jesus tells them to focus their mission on him. To buy from him what they need. To fall back in love with him. So I ask again, are you keeping the faith of Jesus? All of us face things in this world. All of us have doubts. All of us have sins that we need to get rid of. Don't think you're standing too firm that you don't need to do that. So what does this life of faith mean? What does it look like for you? How are you doing in that life? What do you need to throw away? What is entangling you? Keep the faith till the end. Revelation 12, 17. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest, the remnant of her offspring. Those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony, their witness, their martyrdom, if that's what it takes, about Jesus Christ. Because nothing else matters other than your mission for Jesus Christ. The life that He's given you to live now, to yes, enjoy the things of this world, but to live for Him and to teach your children, to tell others, to help others, to, to fight against injustice in this world, to live a life differently so that when people ask you about your faith, that then you present it with gentleness and meekness to them. Hebrews 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with endurance the race set out for us, each one of us individually and collectively as a body. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And the same is out there for you. Finish this race of faith well. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Get rid of anything else and meet Him face to face in heaven. Consider Him who endured such hostility from sinners so that you do not grow weary and lose heart. Ephesians 2, 8-10, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, 
And it is not from yourself, it is a gift of God, not by work, so that no one will boast. For we are God's handiwork, the NLT says, masterpiece. We are created to be God's masterpiece, to do something. Next words say, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. If you believe Jesus has called you out, set you apart, made you holy to be a light, to be His hands and feet, to be His disciple, to be an ambassador. And I could go on and on and on. That means you have a job to do, living for Him, ushering in the kingdom of heaven instead of your own kingdom. For what will it profit you to gain the whole world but forfeit your soul? Most of the times when you read the word faith in the gospel, it's connected with Jesus delivering someone from the oppression the bondage that is on them, whether it's a physical calamity, whether it's demon possession, whatever it is, because He delivers them because of their faith. And if you read closely, He, he delivers them from their faith and then sends them out to be a witness. I'm thinking specifically of the man with a legion of demons, and then he wants to go so much with Jesus. But he says, no, you're going to have to go back and be a testimony here. One man in a foreign land, going back to where Jesus just destroyed their livelihood. They raised pigs. They don't have any pigs anymore for their livelihood. And this man was out in the, in the tombs and everything. They, they, didn't, they didn't care for him anyway. Probably thought, hey, he comes back in, they could very likely kill him. Because it's because of him that this all happened. But Jesus says, no, go be a witness for me. And he says, okay. He doesn't say, but, but wait, Lord, wait. Jesus delivers them to be set free to, to praise and proclaim God's goodness upon mankind. That salvation is here. Today is the day. So let's look at the book of Numbers. We read six chapters. Chapter 1, it's been two years since the Israelites have been delivered. That's why I use that word back um, with the deliverance of our faith. And God has set up standards of holiness. God is faithful. People are kind of faithless, aren't they? <laughs> he numbers His children. He counts them one by one. Not one is lost. Jesus says not one of these will slip out of His hands. You don't have to worry about anything happening to you. No one can snatch you from Jesus' hand. But are you firm in your faith? Are you a true believer? Are you a true disciple? Or when the times in the wilderness come, will you walk away? No one can snatch you away. But do you really believe? Do you hold firm to the faith? God is faithful. He numbers His children, counts them one by one, and all of them are counted for. Chapter 2. He puts an order for them of how they're going to serve. Chapter 3, there is a redemption price that has been paid and set apart. Chapter 4, he gives specific duties and numbering because this is a, something we do together. We do as collectively as a people, a, a, a church, a nation, whatever you want to say for the children of God, the kingdom. That would be the right thing, wouldn't it? Because we are kings and, and priests in this world. Chapter 5, holiness is, is serious. Not just ceremonial, but morally. And he gives us the topic of marriage. Oh yeah, begin because he doesn't want us to be adulterers, especially in our love for him. In chapter 6, we see a vow to serve, and we see the blessings that God is going to give upon his children. Are you firm in your faith? Are you fixing your eyes on Jesus? Will you follow Him even through the wilderness? Okay, so what about the revelation of Jesus Christ to the churches? His revealing of things to come so that we can have hope, not so that we can be scared or worry about whether we're going to have to face this or not. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave Him to show His servants, His slaves. Those who have committed their lives to Him, they're sold out to the King and the kingdom and for His cause. <clears throat> These are the things that must soon come to pass. He made it known by sending His angel to His servant John, who testifies to everything He saw. This is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads 
the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and obey what is written, because the time is near. God continues to pour out blessing upon blessing upon blessing upon blessing upon blessing upon you. So many times we don't even realize it because you've got to go through a little time of wilderness before you can see the blessing. But the time is near. Oh, how much time do you have? We got the call from Pat that Buren had passed away, and she called Alan and Sherry at the same time, did a joint call. And not this Alan. Her brother's named Alan also, so you know. So you don't get confused. <laughs> I don't realize that he even spells it the same way. So Sherry had a brother named Alan and married an Alan. Go figure. <laughs> but she made the phone call, and Alan said on the other end, well, I knew you call hosp called hospice in, but I didn't think it would happen this fast. You don't know. You don't have tomorrow. We don't know even when hospice is called in. You think that you're going to plan this out for tomorrow. You think that. But do you put God in the equation, and do you put in to his plan, who he set in front of you to be a witness for? How much time do you have? Oh, Solomon talks about that in Ecclesiastes, and he also talks about how much money that you need, or how much power, or how much indulgence is the things of this world. When will you be satisfied? When will enough be enough? If I only had this, then I would do that. And that's the excuse of so many Christians. If I do this first, then I will. If I send my kids off to college, if I get this job, if I get this training, whatever it is. If God calls you to do something, listen to what the Spirit is saying. Say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes. What is for sure? Well, you've heard the old saying. Taxes and death, right? <laughs> well, death is, unless you're raptured if that's how you want to look at it. There will be a time when this life is over, let's put it that way. And you will be accountable for every word, every deed, every thought. Wouldn't it be better not to grumble and complain? Would it better not be better to have faith and fix your eyes on Jesus? Wouldn't it be better to have told this person and that person and this person and see them following into the kingdom because of your testimony for Jesus Christ, even if it costs you your life? Revelation 17, 14, they will make war against the Lamb and the Lamb will triumph over them because He is the Lord of Lord and King of Kings. Is He in your life? And He will be accompanied by His called, chosen, and faithful ones. Will you be accompanying Jesus or will you be still waging war against Him? The time is near. Jesus is worthy. That's what Revelation tells us. Ecclesiastes tells us the rest of life is, is meaningless unless you fear God and obey His commandments. From the beginning to the end of the Revelation, from the beginning of the end of the Bible in general, it all points to Jesus Christ. Do you have that adoration for Him that is written in every single word here? Do you realize this great faith that you have? Revelation 1.8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And in Revelation 22, verses 12 through 16, Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Everything else in between is still Jesus. He is everything. He is the beginning and the end. Everything moves and has its being because of Him. What about you? He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Verse 14, the very next words, Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to eat of the tree of life, and may go through the gates into the city, outside of the dogs, those who practice magical arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give this testimony to the churches. So I ask this question again. How many people that walked through the Red Sea on dry ground said, we're not going to enter this promised land that Jesus has said because we're going to sin. We're going to look back. We're going to grumble. We're going to complain. We're going to watch many of us be killed because of our sin. 
I don't think anybody said that. I said, I think they said, we're marching to the promised land. Here we go. Our enemies have been defeated. We will worship and praise the Lord when His covenant is given. They say, yes, we'll obey. They heard the rumbling and saw the, the smoke and everything from the mountain and said, dude, we don't want to go near. Moses, speak for us. You've got to fix your eyes on Jesus every single day so that Satan doesn't creep in there and you don't come off the path. The time is near, Jesus says. When he's talking what we call the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, 21, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many... Every time I read that, I just think of that. Many, but then I read back through the Old Testament, see the remnant that was faithful. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons in your name and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. They did mighty deeds in the name of Jesus Christ, but they didn't know him personally because they didn't love him. They had other adulterous loves that they never got rid of. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. So says the wisest man ever. Hevel, hevel, hevel. Meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. I don't like the word meaningless. That's me. I don't like it. Let me put that in there again. You might like it. I don't like it. How about vanity, vanity, vanity? How about feudal, feudal, feudal? How about what it really is? It's a vapor, smoke. It's here today, gone tomorrow. And you try to grasp hold of it because it looks solid, but you can't. You put your hand right through it. And that's the way you look at things of this world and you chase after them, but they are meaningless, meaningless, meaningless when you do that. Because you chase after everything under the S-U-N instead of everything under the S-O-N. There's the difference. In a nutshell, boom, Ecclesiastes, how's that? You still got to read it if you didn't. Just saying. The word itself means to call an assembly because the preacher or teacher has words of wisdom to give you so that you will learn from them. He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let me hear and obey. One word means the same thing again. Go clean your room, child. That means I'm supposed to obey. There's not a second word for it. Hear means to obey because the Lord God has spoken to you. Ecclesiastes 1, verse 2, meaningless, 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 says the teacher, utterly meaningless. That's the NIV. Everything is meaningless. The ESV is vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. The NASB says fut futility of futilities, says the preacher. Futility of fut futilities, all is futilities. In the New Testament, Paul writes these words in Romans 8, For the creation waited in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. That means some of them won't be revealed that thought they were, will it? That's Romans 8, 19. For the creation was subject to futility, vanity, meaningless, frustration. Because we're a time in the wilderness and we've got to decide, are we going to fix our eyes on Jesus and let Him provide for us? Or are we going to complain about what we saw come down from heaven, which we didn't even know what it was, and we praise God for, for this food that He's given us, and we didn't have to do anything but go out and collect it. And don't collect any more than you're supposed to, and you'll always have enough. Hmm. Maybe we should look back at that now and, th and thank God in our lives. Yeah, we work. But God will provide. Give us, Lord, our daily bread so we don't, we don't put too much trust and faith in the bread we have in our pantries. For the creation was subject to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subject, subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. You face this frustration, these things that you've got to decide are meaningless or not so that you can decide if God is meaningful to you or not. Because all these things you chase after otherwise are hevel, hevel, hevel if you chase after the things under the S-U-N. But if you chase after the S-O, things under the S-O-N, then all the things under the S-U-N, did I get that all right? Will have more meaning. 
Because you'll thank God for what you do. You'll share the things that you have so that there aren't any people in need. You'll love others and do things for them because you'll consider them more than you love yourself. You'll lay down your life to save a friend because that's how you're going to be known is be a disciple of love. Look at the words John wrote. He wanted to rain fire down on the Samaritans because of who he thought they were. And then he says, you're not going to be known if, if you don't love. And if you can't love, you can't love God if you don't love your neighbor. So the teacher asks, what do people gain from their labors at which they toil under the sun? Even wisdom is heaven. That's verse 3 of chapter 1. The teacher was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun, S-U-N, all of them have me are meaningless as chasing after the wind. Hevel, hevel, hevel. What are you chasing after? Solomon was given everything just to show him that all the things that he chased after were meaningless if he didn't fear God and chase after him first. And again, he didn't know the name Jesus. He didn't know of God's love because he gave his one and only son to die for our sins. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 to 14. Now it all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Jesus tells us the same thing. So He tells us to fall back in love, to stop our lukewarmness, to chase after, to, to kill our blindness by buying salve from Him. Whatever it is to fix these things so that we can focus on the mission at hand, that we are a new creation in Christ Jesus to do good works. Revelation 21, verses 5 through 8. He who was sitting, sitting on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the springs of water of life. Think back to the wilderness and the water flowing out of the rock, which is Christ, our firm foundation that we're to build on instead of sand. Those who are victorious will, without a doubt, inherit all this, and will, I will be their God and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, those that lack faith, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral because they had other loves, the murderers because they had hatred in their heart for their brothers, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and the liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. So I ask again, what does the word wilderness mean to you? Sure, it is a bleak place that there might not be water, there not, might not be hope when you look through these eyes under the S-U-N out there. I won't point all the way up. But when you look through the Spirit, because you walk in step with the Spirit, and you look towards the S-O-N, that you'll realize that whatever these things are, light and momentary, as Paul says. It doesn't matter. I have considered all these things rubbish or garbage, garbage that I may know Jesus Christ and make Him known. And then all this will have meaning to you. You'll find the peace that you need to find when you don't have peace. You'll find the joy when, when, you, when you don't have any joy left at all. It'll be like that poem or song, which whatever it is, I don't know, maybe both, where, you know, where were those footprints in the sand when I needed you most? That's when I was carrying you. The wilderness is a place of testing where God has come to meet and to live with those that He has called so that they can worship Him. He has a plan. He is faithful. And He even gives you the Holy Spirit so that you can grow the faith that you have. Jesus said when He was asked to grow His faith, He just said to pray, to increase your faith, that He would give it. And as that faith increased, you could say to the mountain, be moved and it would be cast in the sea. No, I don't comprehend that. <laughs> I can't comprehend that kind of faith. 
But Jesus said, if I, be, if I pray believing, and James said that we should pray believing that way, not like a wave tossed in the ocean. So, Lord, I pray for more faith so that I can live a life that fixes my eyes on Jesus. For this journey that I have through whatever wilderness it may be, to live a meaningful life, to make a difference to the kingdom, and not only to make it home, but show others the way to choose life in the wilderness instead of death. Chasing after Jesus, living for Him, living for the S-O-N, so that all the things under the S-U-N have more meaning. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And we thank you that he is preparing a place for us. Even though we don't understand the concept of time in our mindset, that it is all finished. Jesus said that in Revelation. He is victorious. We just haven't seen it come to, to our eyes yet, to our understanding yet. But help us to live as though we know that it is a fact, that we, that we know our home is in heaven. Scripture even says we're there now because we're with Jesus. He'll never forsake us. He'll never leave us. Help us to rely on the Spirit. Help us to seek your word, to, to, to eat of Jesus daily, to eat of the bread of life, to drink of living water so that we will be filled and nourished and so that we can give bread and life and water to others that, that see our good works and that ask us of the hope that we have. Help us to not be sidetracked. Help us to not be complacent. Whatever things that we need to give to Jesus for him to heal, Lord, we know that he'll heal them that he'll take them all away. Lord, don't have Satan have any root of, into our lives whatsoever. But let us firmly be grounded in the vine, which is Jesus Christ, so that we may produce fruit and produce fruit abundantly. Lord, we thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I put communion out here. And we'll have to have it again soon since a lot of...